Hi, hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the six sessions within the Foundation's 20 Climate Solutions Week here in our studio in Hamburg. And if you onboarded punctually or even a couple of minutes earlier, you will have listened to the great sounds created by Tom Marx, our fantastic pianist. And uh, maybe you've also heard uh, him playing Fly Me to the Moon. And uh, that could actually be a transfer to this afternoon session because uh, on the moon humanity probably saw for the first time how fragile this planet Earth is. Uh, the pictures of the moon uh, also enhanced uh, by Apollo 11 pictures and the first humans experiencing this wonderful blue bubble uh, in the sky and the issues and challenges that we deal with today the limits, the boundaries, the limitations of that which seemed limitless uh, a couple of decades ago have become clear and that is exactly what we're talking about. With me in the studio here is Stefan Schurich. Stefan, uh, great to be my co this afternoon and great we have a, a lot to do. Huh? Absolutely, yeah. Today it's going to be a very... Uh, insightful and very, very um, 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 exciting discussion um, that we're going to hear. Because now we are addressing the G20, right? So we have analyzed a number of the challenges ahead of us. Um, and as you said, indeed, flying to the moon and, you know, seeing the first time the world from outside, seeing how fragile it is. Um, still, it took us a number of decades to really get to the solutions. And now we are hearing that it's just 10 years in which we really have to turn around the steering wheel and uh, the G20 play a key role, which is why Absolutely. we are focusing on them, yes. Thank you very much. And uh, talking about the G20, of course, uh, Saudi Arabia has the presidency of the G20 this year. And uh, we are already uh, seeing Riyadh with us uh, and uh, in the shape uh, and form of Princess Nuf bin Mohammed. Not only are you the C20 chair, but you're also the CEO of the King Khalid uh, Foundation, who has been a uh, co uh, in organizing in uh, creating creating this beautiful Climate Solutions Week here in this hybrid situation. Again, apologies, we can't be with you live, uh, uh, but fortunately, digital allows us to correspond uh, with each other. And uh, Princess Nuf, uh, later on, you will be part of our panel, but now, could you just please get us into the afternoon with your statement? Thank you. Thank you, Connie. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. In the Good September 16th, I guess. Um, it's been an interesting week, a few days, and uh, clearly there's been an important connection uh, that has been made over the last few days. A connection in many ways underscored uh, by the discussions of the week. The current pandemic, with the rapid and inevitable unfolding of its socioeconomic fallout, lies within the broader context of the crises of climate change, of biodiversity crises, and of the continued unsustainable consumption of our natural resources. And it might sound strange to call the present economic effects of the current pandemic an opportunity, and it has been many times over the last few days, but actually that is precisely what it is. It takes a shock to wake those of us who are sleepwalking, and it just might be that the current economic effects of the COVID-19 pandemic is precisely the shock we needed to open our eyes to the injustices of our global economic systems. And governments would do well to consider this opportunity by seriously taking into account our threatened ecosystems and the vulnerable communities that are being left behind. And whilst already committing trillions of dollars in stimulus funds to brace against the shockwave of a global financial meltdown, they must be exhorted by foundations and civil society to take this opportunity to invest and to divest wisely. In truth, the possible risks associated with the much needed conversion of financial instruments pale into relative insignificance at this time when we are poised on the brink of what could be, and depending on how we act, a catastrophe or an epiphany. And we need to build back better to ensure sustained resilience becomes embedded into our social fabric, in our economic structures and in our financial systems and in our vulnerable ecologies. This is also our opportunity 
the C20 and the F20 have the responsibility to identify the gaps and push for change in the G20 at this crucial time. We need to insist that the G20 commit to agreed frameworks and that they demonstrate concrete steps to achieve the goals that they have set and not to renege or move the goalposts. We need to remind the G20 of their commitment to the Paris Agreement. In fact, this is the time, and I think this has been mentioned also, is the time to scale up their commitments and to review those that are insufficient, such as maybe the NDCs. We need to insist on leaders aligning financial flows with the Paris Agreement and the SDGs. And we need to insist on the full transparency of all movements and that the allocation of funds is independently monitored. And surely also there should be meaningful consequences for non-compliance. Civil society must encourage our global leaders and representatives to work collectively with CSOs and to be a driving force towards sustainable change. We need to ensure that for all future potential crises, crises, economic recovery packages are sustainable, environmentally sound, climate resilient, and socially conscious. Our efforts are crucial if we are to counter the political opportunism often found concurrent with global crises, if we are to remove profit maximization from what motivates us, and if we are to counter the building of walls against our common humanity. And though the best in our vision is collaborative and progressive, the current pandemic is surely not the last exigency, and we must not forget that there remains the myopia of the reactionary and the self-seeking. In the 2008 financial crisis, banks and the largest corporate, corporate institutions were considered too big to fail. The existential proclamation then is even more desperate now because it is applicable to us all not just institutions. Mm. And if we truly believe that the earth is too big to fail, then we must prove this by how we act. And what we do in the coming days, weeks and months will have the lasting consequence on our future. Thank you very much. Princess Smoove, I'm uh, very much looking forward uh, to the panel discussion later on when you can expand upon a couple of uh, the ideas and ideals that you've just uh, set uh, out uh, for us to discuss. Um, uh, a great speech here. And uh, um, uh, Stefan, uh, from the Foundation's 20 side, uh, anything you would want to add? Because we always sort of uh, have you both as a co-moderator and, of course, as the Secretary General of the Foundation's 20. Well, especially in this role, I'd just like to extend my uh, um, thanks uh, to you, um, Princess Nu, for uh, the collaboration we had, and also um, like to acknowledge uh, the ride you had with the C20, um, which was, which was of course, uh, quite a challenge. I guess no one uh, envied you, because it's not, it's not only um, uh, looking into uh, the subject that the F20 group has um, clearly committed to with regard to the implementation of the Paris Agreement and within the framework of the SDGs, but I know that the C20 goes um, beyond that and looks into um, pretty much all all points that are discussed at the at the um, uh, uh, G20 level, and dealing with all this contribution is of course quite a quite a challenge. So um, um, that was um, certainly an achievement, I suppose. One one question, maybe, or one one point, um, and you can decide to what extent you can you can refer to that. Um, sort of with regard to the um, um, uh, implementation of um, climate measures or uh, the SDGs, what were sort of the major points that you that you thought were um, subject of controversies? Well, thank you, thank you, uh, Stefan, uh, and thank you for having uh, the C20 uh, here. Uh, you've had uh, Mashari yesterday, and you have uh, Enrique tomorrow, and yeah. also the engagement group. So the outreach is uh, is wonderful. Uh, I think, I mean, we we know uh, climate is on the agenda of the C20, but there are things that they are not agreeing about. Um, what what exactly are the solutions? What are the references? Um, so. The these, these are big issues. Another issue we see is that we really would like for the SDGs and for climate to be um, 
to cut across all, all issues. As you said, we have uh, 11 working groups. Uh, and in the C20, uh, the SDGs is a theme that we look at in all of our 11 working groups. Uh, so we, we, we have broken the silos, and I think this has been the nature of, of the C20. Uh, I think this is, this is the biggest thing that yeah. we need. We need, uh, we need uh, everybody to work in un unison, uh, if I may say, and look at the issues from a global perspective. Again, thank you very much, uh, Princess Snoof. At this point um, in our sequence uh, of uh, affairs, we still have our keynotes, and then we'll get into the proper discussion uh, in the panel discussion. But uh, as we always do at the beginning, uh, we'd like to interact again with you and uh, maybe uh, for today, for the last time, using Mentimeter to get your questions, um, respectively, your ideas. And uh, this time, again, uh, it's maybe not black and white, but it's black and white and grey. Uh, so uh, if you are on menti.com and uh, if you've put in the code 123093, you can actually get into our questionnaire page. And the question that we have now is, do you think that the G20 are the right forum to tackle the climate and sustainability crisis? Yes, no, maybe. And... Uh, Again, this is um, probably not going to take much of a choice uh, for each and every one of you who participates, uh, but we appreciate that digital does not always mean fast, um, and it takes a couple of seconds until um, we actually have the answers proper. Stefan? Yeah, I think it's a very good question because um, we have seen um, leadership from the G20 in certain years and in other years we have been expecting for leadership and um, controversies sort of overwhelmed the, um, um, the countries who wanted to take the lead. But if you look at the G20, um, it's 80% of um, the GDP. It's 80% of the greenhouse gas emissions. It's 20 countries. Um, um, and that include all kinds of different perspectives, perspectives from the global south, but also perspectives from the industrialized countries. Mm. So in my view, um, um, uh, I think they are indeed an important group that if they agree on certain items, we mm. will also see that agreement, that level of agreement um, being reflected in um, UN decisions that ultimately, of course, need to um, um, implement their uh, frameworks of the SDGs and the Climate Paris Agreement. Absolutely, and still a mainstay of multilateralism, uh, even if it's uh, hard work uh, yeah. to get to common decisions. Um, and this is uh, the answer, uh, or these are the answers that we have up to now. Um, I think your Mentimeter uh, reluctant uh, audience right at the moment, uh, but uh, we can say we are uh, at least uh, from your perspective, halfway on the right track, and um, complete no is in the minority. So uh, maybe that reflects also why everybody is chipping in, why they're saying we have to continue the work. And yes, the work is hard. Um, as we said, this afternoon, uh, we are going to talk about recommendations of the engagement groups towards the G20. We have uh, several engagement groups uh, later on in the panel discussion, uh, Princess Nuf, you've already gotten to know, but um, what we have now are two keynotes, and uh, again, referring back to the fact that uh, Saudi Arabia has the presidency of the G20 right now, um, we would like to bring in Adam Siminski. He's the president of the King Abdullah Petroleum Studies and Research Center, much shorter Karpsak, and um, I've been told from spies that when you leave the airport and if you actually get into Riyadh, that you can actually see it. It makes a, a big impression on any visitor uh, coming to Riyadh. Uh, you know, this is the future. This is um, uh, where one of the futures is headed. And I see Adam there. Um, Adam, uh, you have uh, your time to share your thoughts uh, of how that future, within the constraints of uh, biological diversity and climate change, ought to be going or could be going. I think you're not unmuted. Oh, sorry. 
All right. Um, guys, uh, uh, we have a, a lovely number of um, tech technicians sitting try, over there. Try again, maybe? Uh, one more time. Can you hear me now? Yeah, 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 yeah baby. So, sorry. Uh, okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Getting carried Salam away there. <laughs> Salam alaikum. <laughs> and uh, hello to everybody. Thank I'd you. I'd like to uh, thank uh, Princess Noof and the King Holland Foundation for this opportunity to uh, talk about the uh, climate and the circular carbon economy. The, uh, you know, I think that the answer to the question you raised, uh, I suspect that the, the people who didn't say yes to the G20 as the forum is mainly because uh, this is going to take uh, a huge effort of international collaboration among many uh, global institutions. And the uh, G20 is one of those. But uh, but I think we're going to have to engage around the world with, uh, with many, many uh, institutions and individuals to really make progress on this. Uh, climate change has become a key area of focus uh, globally as a result of rising uh, temperatures and daily headlines about fires and floods. The scientific community uh, says that the world faces major threats uh, if we don't take uh, aggressive greenhouse gas emission reductions. Global leaders met in Paris in 2015. I know you've talked about that. Uh, uh, and they pledged to limit global temperature rise this century to below two degrees uh, uh, under pre-industrial levels. But progress on implementing this has been challenging. Many countries are responding to climate concerns by mandating renewable energy sources. Uh, there is also a global movement gaining traction to completely ban carbon as a source of energy. A shift away from traditional fuels could lead to significant uh, unanticipated consequences in the long term and uh, and generate a lot of problems uh, for uh, hydrocarbon rich countries. Uh, a narrow focus on uh, only reducing fossil fuels will result in several unintended consequences. It could result in inefficient utilization of our existing infrastructure, reduced uh, access and reliability and no practical solutions for hard to abate sectors like aviation, shipping, steel, cement, and so on. Uh, I think you have to keep in mind that there are reliable forecasts that suggest that the primary energy mix will still be depending on hydrocarbons even as we move out towards the mid-century. Experts agree that the challenge of achieving climate goals uh, will uh, require uh, pursuing all the options that we have to manage GHG emissions. And it's imperative that we widen the focus to include technologies that reduce CO2 and other uh, GHG emissions. Social and economic consequences of climate policies uh, have to be managed along with the carbon. To bring a perspective, a broad perspective on this, uh, climate mitigation, uh, CAPSARC is partnering with leading international organizations uh, to prepare a guide to the concept of circular carbon economy. It's an integrated and inclusive uh, approach to a more comprehensive, resilient, climate-friendly energy system that supports and enables sustainable development. With CAPSARC acting as the coordinator, the International Energy Agency, the International Renewable Energy Agency, the Nuclear Energy Agency, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and the Global CCS Institute are all writing reports on key elements of the circular carbon economy. This guide will be delivered later this month to the G20. And it's, uh, of course, uh, this is gonna be, I think, a very important thing here in the kingdom. The concept of the circular carbon economy is really an outgrowth of the idea that many people believe in and trust in the circular economy. At its core, the circular economy has organizing principles uh, around the three R's of reduce, reuse, and recycle. The circular carbon economy embraces these three principles and adds a fourth one, remove. These four R's form the basis of how carbon can be managed. The CCE guide will consist of eight reports. And let me just quickly describe those for you. It's gonna span across all four of these R's and we may actually be able to add more to it over time. And as we get uh, you know, further develop these ideas, 
Uh, the IEA will be writing on energy efficiency. IRENA will be writing on non-bio renewables like solar and wind. Uh, nuclear power is being covered by the NEA, carbon utilization, things like fertilizers, methanol, enhanced oil recovery, and so on will be addressed by the IEA. We'll also be looking at bioenergy. Mangrove restoration, for example, is underway here in the kingdom. Carbon capture and storage and direct air capture of carbon dioxide is going to be very important, and we'll have a report on that. We're looking at hydrogen. Keep in mind that NEOM, this uh, big uh, project underway here in the kingdom, is, uh, has a $5 billion budget that includes investment by aquapower and air products to, uh, to move towards green hydrogen. And we'll have an idea from the OECD on enabling policies to push this along. People don't want abstract energy. They typically want cold drinks, hot showers, and big cars. So the corollary in the circular carbon economy is that people don't want bioenergy or carbon utilization or renewables or any other particular form of mitigation. What they want is good products and good services and a clean climate and improved quality of life. And the circular carbon economy welcomes all of these carbon mitigation options to help achieve climate goals. So let me go back to the circular carbon economy again. It's a holistic approach that can guide international efforts towards a inclusive, resilient, sustainable, and carbon neutral net zero emissions energy system. The CCE provides a useful way to uh, understand a broad range of climate mitigation options and how they interconnect. All of the, as the world evolves on its way to meet the Paris Agreement and climate stabilization goals, all of these four R elements have to play a role. How much each of the four R's, reduce, reuse, recycle, and remove, contribute depends on many factors, like what the costs and performance of the technology is, the availability, which will uh, be dependent on geography and geology, public acceptance, and national circumstances. The kingdom is exploring how the CCE concept can be applied domestically and internationally. So the report that forms this CCE guide will provide insights and relative opportunities uh, for each of these elements in the circular carbon economy. And I think it's gonna help leaders here in the kingdom and around the world understand the degree to which each of these elements can contribute to solving this climate challenge and improving the quality of the world that we live in. So again, thank you so very, very much for the opportunity to talk about this and back to you. Adam, uh, this morning, I'm not quite sure whether you were already online, uh, we had Tony Chan also sort of uh, talking about that, uh, maybe sort of uh, underlying it uh, with a couple of graphics so that we could uh, actually follow up uh, on the concept that is not new to you, of course, uh, but it's relatively new in the international discourse. And I think, uh, in fact, it's one of those lighthouse projects of uh, uh, the G20 leadership uh, um, discussions. Uh, so it's absolutely fantastic uh, to see how uh, different presidencies put down their mark and their marker. Um, and now this, this idea of actually um, removing a carbon um, is is something that is uh, incredibly important, even in, in the light of uh, the present day um, uh, scenarios that we have from the IPCC. Um, what do you think? I mean, of course, it's not one solution, but um, in the whole interplay of all the solutions that are out there, what role do you think uh, this vision uh, could take? Well, it's uh, interesting that you would bring up Tony Chan. Kaust, uh, of course, is going to uh, be a key player in this from the standpoint of uh, the uh, scientific uh, and technological uh, review of the, of the opportunity set uh, to do this. Uh, in things like removing carbon, uh, Saudi Aramco and SABIC have been actually very active in pursuing these options. Uh, there's direct air capture uh, opportunities. Uh, there are ways to uh, actually capture carbon uh, from a biological standpoint, as I mentioned earlier, the mm. mangroves, uh, seaweed, yeah. uh, and other opportunities in agriculture. And it's actually very exciting uh, to look across this broad array of opportunity sets and try to find a way to generate the 
scientific interest and the investment that will drive uh, these initiatives forward. And I think uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has a, a terrific opportunity here uh, to show the way and to show the seriousness of the commitment uh, in dealing uh, with uh, climate challenges. <clears throat> Um, so thank you. Uh, um, so grateful that you could be with us uh, to kick off this afternoon. Um, I think right at the moment we don't have any more questions. If so, we actually email I have you. One, like, oh, you do. I'm so yes, sorry. I'm so Stefan. Stefan, question. I'll step back. Um, <laughs> Adam, it's really great that you took the time to be with us. Um, honestly, it really is um, a pleasure having you. And um, one one question that I have because you you alluded to um, a number of those areas that we are looking into on you know with all kinds of different um, think tanks and fora now um, being um, a bit familiar with the G20 process over the last years I sort of and you referred to that Connie as well there is a little bit of a hype in a year and a country gives it a brand and then the next year it's the next presidency and there's a new brand so um, I um, remember that we were um, discussing a great deal the uh, quality infrastructure or sustainable quality infrastructure in the Japanese context last year already. Now with the CCE, I find this an extremely interesting concept because it's a combination of the circular economy, but obviously, and I think we both would agree, there is still much work to do in which pathway we would like to take um, in implementing such a concept. Which kind of forest do you see beyond 2020 where we are going to discuss those elements? Um, which kind of forums or where's the place to really you know, keep on going, um, looking into the different um, um, levels and the different layers of a, uh, um, a CCE or the four R's that you mentioned? All right. Well, that's a, uh, that's a great question. I think you're absolutely right. The, the momentum has to be kept. Uh, on this. Uh, you know, the engagement groups uh, like the F20, C20, and the, uh, the T20, uh, which is, uh, uh, and we're going to hear more from these people uh, in this session, uh, are all looking at, uh, at climate as a very important social and economic uh, issue. And it's really global. Uh, the Italian presidency, I'm sure, will be interested in, in moving on this. Uh, the, um, the energy ministers uh, are uh, looking uh, at uh, these issues in the climate and energy tracks that are uh, being uh, hosted uh, by HRH Prince uh, Abdulaziz. Uh, he's very uh, familiar with uh, all of these ideas in um, in the circular carbon economy and is very much in favor of, of moving uh, in this direction. I think that that in 2021, uh, we can branch out to keep uh, many institutions uh, involved in this around the world. Uh, I think it really is the path forward uh, that will turn what was, I think, a great goal that was set in Paris in 2015 and the practical solutions uh, with significant investment uh, behind them uh, to generate and innovate on the technologies that will uh, really solve this problem. Thanks. Thanks very much. And that will definitely be also one of the recommendations from F20 to link uh, the CC concept with the, with the, with the benchmarks um, set in the, Paris, in the Paris Climate Agreement right, that you alluded to. Connie. Yeah, thank you very much uh, again. And uh, we are looking to get in our second keynote speaker, Axel Mekalova. I hope Mekalova was the almost correct uh, pronunciation. Senior founding partner of Perspectives uh, Climate uh, um, Group. And uh, uh, Axel, you've been actually involved, uh, uh, of course, in UNF Triple C negotiations uh, for many years. Then uh, you've actually been one of the brains behind developing the clean development mechanisms. And uh, uh, there are a number of other things one could actually say about you, but I will cut this uh, intro uh, relatively short because you're going to take it away and you're going to stay with us during the uh, panel discussions. Um, so what is your take on, on the 
priorities um, that we need to set and that also need to be communicated uh, to the G20? Yes, thank you very much. I'm really happy to speak to you on this. So I have a little presentation which I will share with you right now. Thank you. So bear with me for one second, please. There you are. So I want to identify the win-win solution for G20. And of course, uh, Adam Siminski has already very nicely set up the circular economy. Kapsak last year published a nice piece in which the various streams in the circular carbon economy were actually shown. Uh, so you see that, of course, the relevant question then is how the different technologies will be mobilized. And um, this was already set up in your discussion. Of course, the G20 is not an almighty body. It can coordinate win-win solutions but it will not be able to push solutions that lead to burdens or losses for important groups of states. So we think that uh, the presidency will be interested in solutions that are really relevant. And therefore, the engagement groups, of course, they should focus on win-win solutions with a Saudi flavor. And uh, as, uh, for example, Ambassador Khalid Abulif has also stressed the relevance of the circular carbon economy, it's of course important that the solutions somehow relate to this basic concept. Of course, now within the engagement groups, we have very different ideas of how solutions should look like. Business wants profitability of solutions. The civil society wants to assure that there are broad development co-benefits of the solutions. Labor wants, of course, to ensure that jobs are created and not lost. The science uh, engagement group wants the solutions to be consistent with science. And very often, uh, there are problems with solutions that not all scientific results are taken into account. The think tank 20, they of course want to ensure the feasibility of the solutions. And I've been very happy to participate in the T20 process uh, with two policy papers. And I think there is now a real wide array of solutions that is to be picked up by the presidency. For the urban vulnerable youth, of course, all of those have their specific interests. And it is now important how this universe that you see on the right hand side, yeah, rotates in a sense that it really enables the D20 to uh, fulfill its job. And I want to focus on two win win solutions that in my view are really bringing together aspects that can benefit all of the engagement groups. The first one relates to climate friendly recovery from the corona crisis. So there is of course now the window of opportunity that many governments have earmarked uh, a lot of funding for recovery. And in that context, of course, it is crucial to harness public private cooperation. And uh, there is a high willingness to take bold policy decisions in the context of the crisis. So here there are five elements uh, that could be relevant to be launched by the G20. Of course, to ensure that any fiscal programs for risk recovery focus on labor intensive activities and really low emission technology. You've heard from Adam with regard uh, to the opportunities that exist there. Then critically to establish basic infrastructure for low carbon transport and energy supply. The third point is very dear to me because I think today's event embodies it perfectly. Persistent behavioral changes for low carbon action with regard to communication interaction and also teaching and learning. Then, and one aspect which of course may be a bit more difficult to really embark upon, but where there are also a lot of opportunities, low carbon and high value tourism. And the last point, which of course has been contentious over many years, but where now there is really a good window of opportunity relating to the possibility to remove fossil fuel subsidies. The second win-win solution I would like to put up is carbon neutral hydrogen. 
Here on this slide, you see uh, the possibility for hydrogen to really transform the way that energy is carried along throughout the world and that it is used. And the interesting aspect about um, the carbon neutral hydrogen is that it can allow to bring in a lot of different interests, also countries with different endowments of natural resources, and enable a transformation of sectors that so far have been very difficult to de de decarbonize. And of course, for the circular carbon economy concept that has been laid out by the presidency, this could be a key solution because it allows to use intermittent renewable energy, which otherwise is difficult to use. It is very versatile with regard to the end use. And of course, it can also go hand in hand with the development of uh, capture and storage technologies or even negative emission technologies. And there, we would think that there are three principal approaches C20 could take on. The first one would be the coordination of the ramp up of the new global hydrogen market for both green and blue hydrogen. Then also work together in the, with other international agreements and processes to use innovative market mechanisms under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change uh, that could actually provide revenues for transboundary collaboration and to also enable specific lighthouse initiatives because very often uh, we'll have a rapid diffusion of technology once they are shown to work in a specific context. So with those ideas, and I hope that they can be taken up in the discussion with the representatives of the various engagement groups, I would like to give back to the moderation. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's very seldom that a scientist is actually shorter than promised. Uh, so thanks very much uh, for saving uh, a little bit on that. Um, you, it was fantastic to see the enumeration of sort of the, the different aspects, how the different engagement groups uh, with the GDNG come in, uh, what their interest in uh, is, and then, of course, looking at the technical solutions that uh, you provided us with. I'm uh, quite sure that Stefan... Um, uh, whose face I still cannot interpret properly, uh, so I probably know more, <laughs> wanted to ask a question. Uh, yes, I'm happy to do so, and thanks, um, uh, Axel, for being with us. And um, you've been really looking into these different solution pathways for um, a number of years already. And um, I got the sense that uh, the hydrogen economy, be it with blue or with green or with turquoise, hydrogen um, is becoming sort of um, an important, uh, really one of the key pillars of a future um, energy system. And it provides, of course, a number of um, opportunity. Um, because it basically can make sense that you um, convert um, uh, wind and solar radiation into electricity and use this electricity to produce hydrogen or all the other ways that you've just described. Um, so um, in order to making sure that it's uh, really ultimately a zero carbon pathway, um, I guess that's where your suggestions are moving towards to what's the feedback that you get um, while you were uh, writing those mm -hmm. papers? Mm -hmm. what's, the, what's the discussion that you had? Were there any sort of, you know, elephants in the room that you had to mention or that had to be described um, or solved somehow in this process towards this? Because we see this also from the German government. They take a bold stand on hydrogen, not on all the parts that are um, possibly renewably, but um, what's your experience? The experience is that everyone is very enthusiastic about the concept, but of course uh, now we need to have really the proof that it can work on the ground mm -hmm. so that we can enable, for example, yeah. countries like Saudi Arabia to put, build up the infrastructure to produce sufficient quantities of hydrogen or also, of course, the countries uh, of the G20 in the north to do it for renewable hydrogen feedstock, that there is sufficient trust on the demand side that this is actually available in sufficient quantities and also, of course, at costs that are attractive for the use. So to really work on the whole value chain in a trustful manner 
there, an organization like G20 can really play a crucial role because it brings all these interests uh, together in, on one table and enables then to find out what are the steps of the value chain where really the international joint work can make a big difference. And I think there, I would hope that the presidency can really push and that, of course, uh, this will not be the work of one single presidency. It needs mm -hmm. to be sustained over a number of years. Uh, but I think we could have a really good starting point because I sense there is a consensus that this is a good solution. I don't want to water down on our panel discussion with this question. And um, this is something that we've observed as journalists, uh, what is happening now in the C-19 context. Politicians actually listen to what scientists are saying. Um, that is something that in the climate debate... Um, was like, yes, they listened, but with half an ear. Um, do you find that maybe this change of uh, credibility of science has already spilled over into the credibility and to the um, listenability um, of uh, science within climate solutions? I think that scientists can be catalysts of a good discussion between policymakers and private sector players and the other engagement groups. Because science, and we've seen that in the COVID crisis, has now gained stature as being an honest broker, also bringing together understanding by very different kinds of interests. And I hope that we as scientists working in various fields of climate change solutions can play this role.